this is a way of eating that's for life, that is satisfying, that satisfies not only your taste buds, but your body's need for nutrients. And it's just, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's not just a diet. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We're your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, everybody. I'm Hilda Labrada Gore, and this is episode 162. My guest today is Sally Fallon Morrell. Sally is a well-known speaker, activist, and the author of the cookbook, Nourishing Traditions. She is also the founder and the head of the Weston A. Price Foundation. Sally is amazing, and today she walks us through the Wise Traditions Diet, or better put, the Wise Traditions Lifestyle. She explains the set of 11 principles that are common to traditional diets around the world. These are guidelines for healthy eating, such as including fermented foods in the diet, avoiding processed foods, and preparing grains properly. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that this way of living has transformed the health of thousands of people. And of course, it's changed my own life as well. It's powerful and nourishing to eat this way and to live this way. If you're tired of dietary fads, living the wise traditions way is the way to go. So listen closely to this conversation and be encouraged. Before we dive into it, we want to recognize our sponsors. The Wise Traditions podcast is supported in part by Vintage Tradition Tallow Balm, the original whole food of skincare. Check out their new products, including a non-toxic paperboard tube for lips and on the go. Get yours now at VintageTradition.com. And Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. New Zealand sourced liver, organ meats, and bone marrow in convenient gelatin capsules. Order yours today at ancestralsupplements.com. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Sally. Uh, Thank you, Hilda. Thanks for having me back again. Well, we realized recently that we're always talking about the Wise Traditions diet, the Wise Traditions diet, and then it suddenly occurred to us, Maybe people actually aren't quite sure what we're talking about. So can you give us an overview of what the Wise Traditions Diet is? Yes. So the Wise Traditions Diet is based on the principles of how people ate in healthy traditional cultures. Uh, Dr. Price used the word primitive, but it's not just uh, people very much in the past, but cultures uh, closer to us like Europe and the Middle East and so forth. People who are, have not been invaded by processed food. How, how do they really eat? And how could we know that? Well, we know, first of all, by the studies of Weston Price, but we also have lots and lots of studies today showing us how traditional people eat, uh, what the aspects of their diet were. So at the Weston A. Price Foundation, we have these 11 principles, as you know. Four of them were formulated by Dr. Price, but the others having to do with salt and grains and fermented foods, uh, broth, these were all added by us to, to make the 11 principles. I see. And so how do we know that that's the best way for us to eat as traditional people did? Well, I like to talk about the scientific validation of traditional food ways. So let's talk about broth for a minute. Uh, Almost all traditional cultures use the bones, usually cook the bones to make a broth. Even the American Indians uh, cooked broth, cooked bones to make broth, and they considered it to be healthy. Well, that's the tradition, okay? But what does science tell us about the broth? And now we find that the science completely validates these traditions, that it was good to cook the bones and, uh, you know, drink the broth. Oh, so it's not just like, oh... It's a custom from the past. We should incorporate it today, but there's science to back this up. Absolutely. And the, the thing that's so gratifying to us is the science that's backed up Dr. Price over the years. Uh, it's, he, he isn't someone to be dismissed because he did this work many years ago. The science is constantly validating the need for the fat-soluble vitamins, for example. Uh, the need for child spacing, that's been validated by the science. The need for The need for having animal foods in the diets, that's been validated by the science. So, you know, when we see these things in the past and we can show the science that supports this, then we know we're on the right track. 
What I don't understand, Sally, is why some groups that are all about like this ancestral living or even paleo ways, you know, um, they think that certain foods should be excluded because our ancestral our ancestors didn't eat them, like grains or dairy. What would you say to that? Well, it's true that some groups did not eat grains or dairy, but other very healthy groups did eat grains and dairy. And we like to say that our diet is inclusive. We're not telling you what to eat. We're telling you if you want to eat grains, this is how they need to be eaten so they will be healthy for you. If you want to eat dairy foods, this is how you should eat the dairy foods so that they will be healthy for you. And here's what we've done in modern processing that makes them unhealthy for you. The grains are not per se unhealthy. The grains are very, very hard to digest. They are the hardest food to digest. And so traditional cultures prepared these grains in a way that pre-digested them by soaking, fermenting uh, sourdough. Sourdough is a fermentation process. So we teach people, if you want to have grains, here's how you can do it. Uh, if you want to have salt, all traditional cultures had salt in their diet. Uh, it's very important. We need sodium. We need chloride uh, for our bodies to work. And But you need the unrefined salt that hasn't been processed, that doesn't have added aluminum, but that has all the original trace minerals. So it's kind of like the Wise Traditions Diet lays everything out. It's like a buffet, and people can pick and choose what they want to have because like you said, some traditional peoples ate certain things and others ate less of it. For example, the fat. Let's talk about the fat a little bit. Okay, so we say, yes, you can. You can eat fat. You can eat butter, um, cream, egg yolks, lard, beef fat. You should eat these fats. They contain very important uh, elements for your body. However, we also say how much fat you eat is a very individual thing. Some people can eat lots and lots of fat and have no problems. Other people get very nauseous if they eat too much fat. It's because they're not producing enough bile or maybe missing some kind of enzymes for producing the fat. So how your particular diet is going to be one that, first of all, you can eat without it causing you any discomfort or harm. So that would depend on your heritage, your background, your genetics, you know, uh, how you ate as a child, it can all predispose you to certain ways of eating. It would depend on your budget. <laughs> it would depend on the time you have to prepare that food. And I always say it depends on whether your children will eat it too. So, <laughs> so you're going to have to formulate a diet that works for you, but we hope that the diet that you choose will incorporate these principles. I see. Okay. Now, you mentioned something interesting when you said um, our heritage. Some people have asked me when I talk to them about wise traditions, they're like, oh, does that mean if I have Germanic heritage that I should be eating more, let's say, uh, sausage and kraut? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know how to answer that. Should we be eating more according to our heritage, do you think? Well, that's a very hard question to ask because most of us are very mixed heritage. <clears throat> um, I'm certainly a mixed heritage, and I think uh, we all are. So it's a little bit hard to tease all that out. And I think it's just by trial and error that we have to figure that out. But you probably will be attracted to certain foods that uh, your ancestors ate for sure. Absolutely. I, I just, I'm a huge carnivore. I love pork. My dad grew up on the island of Cuba where they were eating pork all the time, you know, so I think that's natural for me. That's right. And uh, I find that I, my ancestors on one side came from Switzerland. I have several ancestors that were Swiss. And I, I just love dairy products. I can't get enough of them. And uh, I can drink uh, raw milk that hasn't been fermented, so just straight milk. And that shows a very high tolerance to, to dairy. Excellent. Well, I kind of want to go through the 11 principles briefly now so people know what we're talking about. Again, this is not a prescriptive diet where we're saying you must eat all these things, but if you're going to, here's how. So can we go over that? Okay. So the first principle was no processed foods. And that is a very, quite a difficult one for many people because we're so used to eating processed foods. So, uh, we say, I, I like to say, uh, purge first, go just purge your cupboards, throw it all away, and then learn to prepare the very simple things, you know, learn to prepare oatmeal, uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast, learn to make salad dressing, just get some real basic uh, recipes and just 
I, I mean, there really is no substitute for cooking, unless you're very wealthy and you can have somebody come in and cook for <laughs> you, which is fine also. That's fine, too. Okay, so that's number one. And the second one is that all traditional cultures had animal foods in their diet. We really do warn people about veganism. It's bound to lead to nutritional deficiencies. And there was a study quite recently out of England which showed that ve vegans and well, vegetarians and especially vegans had more tooth decay, more cancer, more mental illness, they had a lower quality of life, and they had needed more medical care. So there really is a reason we're telling you you need those animal foods in your diet. And some people may not want to hear this. It's very trendy to go vegetarian or vegan right now. And unfortunately, people might have to learn through experience. We know so many people who are actually trying to recover from that kind of a diet and the damage it's done to their body. I think there was a survey that found that 85% of people who try to be vegetarian or vegan go back to eating animal foods. They crave them. And that's the body's wisdom saying, uh, you know, you need to give these animal foods to me. Now, I understand where the argument comes from that you don't want to be cruel to animals. And certainly our modern agricultural system is very cruel to animals. But, you know, find a farm where they're doing it right. Buy, buy from the farmer. And again, you don't need to eat a lot of meat, but you do need to eat some, some animal foods, even if it's, and if it's dairy food that you're going to eat, they should be raw because the pasteurization destroys the B12. Excellent. All right. So what's the third principle? So the third principle is the nutrient density principle. This is the very important principle that traditional diets, everything they did, increased the nutrients in their diet and especially the fat-soluble activators. So to get those fat-soluble activators, vitamins A, D, and K, you need to put a real emphasis on certain foods. And these certain foods are uh, butter, cream, egg yolks from pastured cows, organ meats. Learn some way or another to get these organ meats in your diet. Cod liver oil is a good way to do it. Uh, certain seafoods like oily fish, fish eggs, shellfish. Uh, so th as much as you can, try to get these items into your diet. We just did an interview recently with Chris Masterjohn, so people should go back and look for that one on, I think it was his rules of thumb on diversifying our diet, and he mentioned organ meats especially. Yes, and it's it's hard. I mean, I grew up and never had an organ meat, <laughs> so, and I had health problems too, and when I learned about pate, which is a wonderful French way of making awful taste good, uh, then um, I... I just couldn't get enough of it. So, you know, you can make pate, you can buy it, and spread it on some beautiful sourdough bread with a little dab of orange marmalade. It's just delicious that way. So, so uh, yeah, but we do need to reteach ourselves to eat organ meats. And I understand, let's say there are some young moms listening right now, they can help shape their children's palate by feeding them some of these nutrient-dense foods when they're little so that they will be accustomed to eating the organ meats. And I've heard they just eat it all up. Uh, yes. If they're used to it as when they're young, they will eat them. Yes. Excellent. So what's the next principle, Sally? Well, the next principle has to do with cooking. All traditional cultures cook some or most of their food, but they all had some raw animal food. And I believe the most important reason to have raw animal food is to get our B6 because that's the best source of it. And it's very fragile and destroyed by heat. So the easiest way to do that is drink raw milk and eat raw cheese. But there's also the wonderful, delicious ways of eating raw meat. Oh, right. Like, a, what do they call it? Steak tartare. Steak tartare. <laughs> you know, whenever I'm feeling just like a little bit down, I need extra energy, that's what I eat is a raw hamburger. And I tell you, it just perks you right up. I mix it with raw egg yolk and onions and spices, and it's delicious. Wow. So it's all on a spectrum, you guys. If you're like, I need to take it easy when I start with this raw stuff, yeah. start with the raw milk or the raw cheese and then work your way up to that steak tartare. Or if you can't tolerate the raw milk, then make some kefir or yogurt out of the raw milk. Mm -hmm. ah, very good. All right. And what's the next principle? Well, the next principle has to do with the high content of food enzymes and beneficial bacteria in the diet. And that, of course, comes from fermented foods. So foods like really raw sauerkraut or pickles or um, kombucha or uh, uh, kefir drinks. Uh, we need, we definitely need those in our diet and 
uh, without exception, all traditional peoples had fermented foods in their diet. Now, some of them are um, not considered uh, very appetizing, like fermented seal blubber. <laughs> I don't think we would want to eat that. And there was some really strange fermented foods in Africa. I'm not saying you have to eat those, but uh, I think we can all embrace sauerkraut or these beverages or uh, yogurt and kefir are other fermented foods. We absolutely need fermented foods in our diet. So they're strange to our kind of Western palate that's not used to it. And some people say the standard American diet, the SAD diet, is the only one that doesn't have a ferment in it. That's exactly right. Everything is uh, treated with heat. It's called a kill step, and that's exactly what it does. It kills everything. And the FDA and all of these organizations that are involved in food production, food safety, they believe that everything has to be heat treated. So everything has to be killed. And so there really are no uh, enzymes and good bacteria in the standard American diet. And we're paying the price with the terrible digestive disorders and also mental disorders because the good bacteria in our guts produce all these feel-good chemicals that we need. Absolutely. And I'm thankful that I see this trend happening, Sally, where you can even buy kombucha at the Safeway. Like people are looking into ferments and maybe our own need for it is kind of bubbling up to the surface. Oh, I hope so. I call it the bubble up economy. (laughs) Not the trickle down economy, but the bubble up economy. (laughs) Coming up, Sally touches on two important topics, grains and fat. Why do so many seem to have sensitivities to grains and struggle to digest them? Which fats should we avoid if we want to have a more healthy body? Sally answers these questions and more as we continue to roll through the principles that make up the Wise Traditions diet. You're listening to the Wise Traditions podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. The Weston A. Price Foundation, of course. Did you know that we offer the basics on the Wise Traditions diet right on our website? That's right. Go to the homepage, westonaprice.org, click on the green button that says get the basics of the Wise Traditions diet, and that's it. You'll get seven easy lessons sent directly to your inbox for free. It's a great way to reinforce the information you're hearing on today's show. And Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements offer New Zealand-sourced bone marrow and nose-to-tail organ meats like liver, heart, kidney, pancreas, spleen, and more in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. Traditional peoples and early ancestral healers believe that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. In other words, a person with a weak heart would eat the heart of a healthy animal, and so on. I know I don't get enough organ meats in my diet, so I went ahead and got some supplements for myself. Visit ancestralsupplements.com today to see what they can do for you. Ancestral supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Number six has to do with grains, grains, seeds, legumes. It's fine to include those in your diet as long as they've been carefully prepared. And by that, we mean soaking, sprouting, uh, fermenting the sourdough bread. Uh, we soak our oatmeal overnight with a little bit of acidic water. All of that will pre-digest these grains and make them make it so that we can tolerate them. And this really is a wise tradition, isn't it? It absolutely is. It's found everywhere in the world. These uh, traditional cultures knew how to prepare their grains so that they would be digestible. And again, uh, we're seeing that we've gotten in trouble with grains. People are highly intolerant of grains today. We were on our third or fourth generation of not having a clue how to prepare these grains. And even worse, eating breakfast cereals and granola and muesli and grains that are not even cooked and prepared in a way that makes them more toxic And when I talk about the breakfast cereals. That reminds me, I've heard some people saying that oat milk is popular now. I have no idea what that even is. Do you? I don't, but again, I would be very careful. Oats are very high in phytic acid, and you're going to end up with mineral deficiencies, uh, eating a lot of oats that haven't been properly prepared. So when we were talking about eating raw earlier, it does not include grains, right, Sally? That's right. That's right. No raw grains. The seventh principle has to do with the amount of fat in the diet. And again, we're not giving you a fixed number. Some people need more. Some people need less. Personally, I 
uh, get very hypoglycemic if I don't have enough fat with every meal. So I need a lot of fat in my diet. Other people might not be able to digest all that fat. But the one thing that's consistent across all these diets is they didn't have a lot of polyunsaturates. So this is the liquid oils, which of course is the number one fat that people are using today. And they're in the spreads, they're in the cooking oils, they're in all the processed foods. So you really want to minimize these polyunsaturated oils uh, because the, our bodies are not used to that. We basically want saturated and monounsaturated fats in our bodies. So this has led to a huge education campaign on our part because the establishment, conventional nutritionists, have made saturated fat the enemy. And nothing could be further from the truth. We, we absolutely need saturated fats. Wow. And so this one, I feel like ties back to the eating fewer processed or denatured foods, because when you said polyunsaturated, I thought immediately to the ingredient list on the back of a jar of peanut butter, you know, and how that it's popping up in every processed food or not every, but many. So the idea is if we get rid of some of those processed denatured foods, maybe at the same time, we're getting rid of some of these artificial or overly processed oils. Exactly. And you know, it's ironic because we have finally gotten rid of the trans fats in the diet. That was thanks to Dr. Mary Enig and her work. And why were they doing the trans fats? Because they knew that the oils were dangerous, that they broke down, they became rancid, they caused cancer. And so they said, well, we're going to hydro- partially hydrogenate these oils, we're going to make trans fats, and that will make them safer. And then, and they said, there's no, nothing wrong with the trans fats. Well, then we found out that there was a lot wrong with the trans fats. And so now what have we done? We've gone from the frying pan back into the fire, basically, because they're using mostly liquid oils. And they're even lo- using these liquid oils in the fry pans in fast food places. And this is just a recipe for cancer. Yeah, and those oils are all over the place. So we really have to stay alert. So thank you for that. All right, so what's number eight? Okay, number eight has to do with the balance of omega-3 and omega-6. And uh, we're in the Western diet. We get way, way too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3. Unfortunately, people have tried to compensate by using a lot of flax oil or something, and that's not good either. We need a little bit of omega-3 and a little bit of omega-6 in the diet, and especially the elongated ones, so like DHA, which is the elongated omega-3, that's in the fish fish and seafood and cod liver oil, those kind of things. But that has to be balanced with the elongated omega-6, which is arachidonic acid, which is in animal fats. So you need the fish liver oils and the animal fats. You need the seafoods and the land animals. And that gives you that nice balance of omega-3 and omega-6. The seafood and the land animals. Thank you for translating that into plain English, because <laughs> this is the one that's the most complicated to me with all these omega things. But yes, now I do have to bring up just briefly, people often say to me, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of seafood because of the mercury in fish or the plastic in the ocean. What would you say to that? Well, the mercury in the fish has always been there. I mean, most mercury comes from volcanoes, and we're a very volcano-y planet, so <laughs> it's always been mercury in the ocean. And when you have good gut flora, when you're eating your fermented foods, they'll keep that out of your body. So they will protect you from the mercury. So I'm not too concerned about mercury in fish. In fact, many studies have shown that pregnant women who eat fish give birth to babies that are more intelligent. So you definitely need those seafoods. And we we encourage people to eat seafood. Okay, uh, number nine has to do with salt. All traditional cultures ate salt. And you need salt. (laughs) You need salt for digestion. You need salt for brain function. You need salt for um, your adrenal gland. You need salt just for your cellular biochemistry of your cells. So uh, we need about a teaspoon and a half of salt per day. And in the past, we actually ate more salt. We ate about three teaspoons per day because all the meat was highly salted. But uh, it's not a good idea to cut back on salt and just eat as much salt as your body thinks it needs. Do you have a story you could tell us about the dangers of going too low on salt? Uh, Absolutely. I've had a number of holistic physicians tell me that they're seeing a lot of parasites in people who go on low salt diets. And the reason is that we need the chloride in salt to make hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is the chief barrier to parasites getting in the digestive tract. So if you're eating lots of salt, you'll have a lot of protection against any parasites that might be in your food. But if you're not eating salt, you don't make the hydrochloric acid. 
and you, and you have no protection against parasites. And you also will find it very hard to eat meat if you don't eat salt. Interesting. Plus, salt really brings out the flavor in food. I love salt. Yeah, you know, I, I like to say the creator didn't put a salt taste bud in our mouths to torture us. <laughs> <laughs> he or she or they uh, put it there to make you put salt on your food because it p- tastes better with the salt. Very good. That's another thing I actually love about these wise traditions principles. This is not a diet of deprivation or suggestions that are going to be hard to keep. It's just quite the contrary. Yes, this is a diet you can really stay on. I don't even really like the word diet. This is a way of eating that's for life, that is satisfying, satisfies not only your taste buds, but your body's need for nutrients. And just it's a lifestyle. It's, It's not just a diet. It's a lifestyle. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, are we on number 10? Yeah, number 10 is that all traditional cultures made use of bones, usually by making a nourishing bone broth. And basically what you get in that bone broth is a lot of collagen, which you need in addition to muscle meats, you also need the collagen in the animals to support your own collagen. And the other nice thing about broth, it has a lot of glycine in it, which is a great mood regulator. And there really is some truth in the fact that chicken soup makes you feel good because the glycine just brings your dopamine up to the right level. Wow, that's wonderful. So that's another wise tradition of giving soup to those who are sick or soup to those who may be feeling down and it boosts you up. And the beautiful thing about broth is that you can use it to make gourmet sauces. So you can have a gravy, you can have a reduction sauce, you can have all these beautiful sauces in your diet. And of course, they make food taste wonderful. And they're actually good for you if they're made the right way. That sounds delicious. <laughs> and now number 11, this is the last one. This is the last one. And I think it's a principle that most groups promoting good nutrition or nutrition, what passes for nutrition, uh, they completely gloss over this. And this is the importance of child spacing. In the cultures that Dr. Price visited, especially in Africa and the South Seas, they made sure they put three years between each child. And this principle perfectly accords with the science. The science has shown us that the ideal spacing for the Physical development of the child and the health of the mother mother is three years, and the ideal spacing for the emotional development of the child is three years. So uh, there's a lot of wisdom here, and let's face it, uh, moms need to recover from the stress of childbirth. Mm -hmm. Dr. Price considered this a very great stress on the body to grow a child, and you need to recover your nutritional stores. And that way, if you're spacing your children and making sure you're having this nutrient-dense diet between each child, everybody will be in the family will be born with the same deck of cards. And I can tell you, just in my own children, that it really cuts down on the jealousy. You know, all the children are smart and good-looking and athletic and healthy. There's nothing to be jealous about. I see what you're saying. In other words, if you have your kids closer together, the body isn't quite ready and offers less nutrients maybe to the next child. That's that's exactly right. And and typically in the very large American families with each child, the face got narrower, the teeth more crooked, the children were less attractive, they were less intelligent, and sometimes you'd have a down syndrome child as the last or second to last child because the mother was just completely depleted of nutrients. Now does this last principle also include how the cultures made special provision for those in the childbearing years in terms of giving them special foods? Yes, absolutely. They prepared for conception. There were special foods that they ate before conception. And again, it was these very nutrient dense foods like organ meats, butter, eggs, uh, seafood, raw milk. Um, Just for example, in Africa, they were not allowed to marry until the the season of the grasses. And when there was plenty of grass and the cows were eating grass and they were drinking the milk of the cows eating grass, then they could get married because they were getting the right nutrients for healthy children. Giving the right start to those babies that haven't even been conceived yet. Yes. And to me, this is the most gratifying part of our work, that the parents who have taken our suggestions to heart, who have prepared for pregnancy with our nutrient-dense diet, who've taken their cod liver oil, drunk raw milk, eaten organ meats, plenty of butter, uh, lots of eggs, 
and then they continue that diet through the pregnancy, through breastfeeding, and those are the first foods they give to their babies. These children are just beautiful. They have beautiful faces, strong, straight teeth. They're intelligent. Um, they're, they're just healthy all over. And that is the greatest gift you can give to a child, but it's also the greatest gift you can give to your family. That's beautiful. Well, I just want to ask you two more questions as we wrap up. One is, what would you say to a person who has noticeable sensitivities or reactions to, let's say, um, dairy, even if it's raw or what have you? What should they do? Yes, and this is a, a big challenge, and this is the result of several generations on processed food, and you have the leaky gut or not a good immune system or whatever, and Unfortunately, these people are going to need to be much more careful with their diet, and those diets might need to be restrictive. You might have to say, I can't do dairy, or the only dairy I could do is butter and cheese, and you may have to um, avoid those foods. Um, You might not be able to eat wheat, for example, because that's the hardest grain to digest. It's actually the most nutritious grain, but it's also the hardest grain to digest. So, yes, uh, for those those. Uh, individuals, they're going to have to be more restrictive, uh, more careful in their diets. But hopefully, their children, if they have followed our principles, their children will be able to eat a, a much more varied diet and include those things. Yeah, I think you're right. Dr. Price said that within one generation, the um, physical degeneration could be reversed. In other words, not just their appearance, but also their physical disposition? Uh, well, I, we say one generation. It depends. <laughs> it depends on how long you've been eating processed foods. I know in my own family, my dad used to sit at the table and say, I don't understand why your mom and I have straight teeth and perfect eyesight. My dad was a pilot. And why all you children need braces and glasses. All four of us needed braces and glasses. And so he was asking the right question. So it's just one generation there because my parents had been very well-formed and and healthy. Now, I was able to reverse the crooked teeth in my children in just one generation. None of them needed braces. But I wasn't able to reverse the glasses. (laughs) They all needed glasses, but it wasn't as strong a prescription as I needed. So hopefully my grandchildren will not need glasses. They'll be in the second generation of the Wise Traditions diet. Wow. Well, this has been a super inspiring conversation. I hope it's been informative to the listeners. Please give us your feedback on Instagram or on Twitter or just on our website in terms of what else you want to know about the Wise Traditions diet. So Sally, I want to wrap it up with this question. If the listener just wanted to take one step in the direction of incorporating some of these principles into their own diet today, what would you recommend they begin with? I always say for the first step, eat butter. Just switch to butter and get rid of all the industrial fats and oils. So, And you can just do that by eating butter, cooking in butter. I mean, you can graduate to cooking in other good animal fats, but eat butter. And then secondly, I would say make your own salad dressing. Don't buy these bottle dressings. I mean, they're the worst processed food there is. Uh, Using good olive oil. So you go first the butter and then the olive oil for your salads. Well, that sounds tasty and wonderful. So thank you for this time today. I really appreciate talking to you. Thanks, Hilda. It's always a pleasure. My guest today was Sally fallon Morell. Check out her blog at nourishingtraditions.com. For a summary of today's episode and highlights, just go to westonaprice.org and look for the show notes for episode 162 on the podcast page. There you'll see our listener survey. Please take just a moment to fill it out. And thanks in advance. Also, don't forget you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a thing. Someone told me recently, gosh, I wish I knew when your episodes were coming out. (laughs) They come out every Monday, but don't miss them. So subscribe now. You can also rate and review our show on iTunes. We read each and every review and it means so much to us. It lets us know that what we're doing really matters. Oh, and one more cool thing, you guys. This podcast will be available in December on Pandora through Pandora's new Podcast Genome Project. We'll put that link in the show notes for sure, so don't worry. (laughs) Next week, my guest is Forrest Moretti. Forrest is the host of the My Incredible Opinion Show, and he is the author of Crooked, Man-Made Disease Explained. In our conversation, he explains his theory that metals, 
incorrect antibiotic usage, chronic inflammation, and a few other elements create not only crooked faces, but conditions such as eczema, allergies, and asthma. That is just the tip of the iceberg. He discusses the problem and the answer, which he says is pretty much as plain as the nose on our face. It's a fascinating conversation that sheds light on a new approach to an increasingly growing problem. Finally, a quick thank you to our podcast production team. Assistants include Cassie Reef, Diva Risby, Melanie Ahern, and Ari O'Hara. Cheryl Huftelin helps with social media. Mary Hine, Olga de Villiers, and Joy de los Santos boost sponsorship and help with special projects. Our listening team includes Heather Carpentier and Victor Cosetto. And Amy Matias helps with transcriptions. I just saw Amy at the recent Wise Traditions Conference. So fun. And music is from Michelle Bloom's CD, Big Backyard, specifically the track called Sunny Side Up. Find her at allthingsbloom.com. So that's it. Let's keep in touch, everybody. I'm on Instagram at Holistic Hilda. Follow me for health tips, podcast stuff, behind the scenes on the show, and me. Thanks, and see you soon. Oh, and if you ever want to launch a podcast, hit me up. I give free 15-minute consults to those considering launching shows and to those who want to take their show to the next level. Go to holistichilda.com and just reach out to me and we'll set up a time to talk. Thanks and see you soon. Thanks for listening today. We have all kinds of resources to support you on your health journey. On the Weston A. Price Foundation website, you'll find podcasts, blogs, articles, and brochures related to just about any health topic you can imagine. You can also find a local chapter to help you discover sources of real, organic food in your area. And you can become a member to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism. Visit WestonAPrice.org for all this and more. And remember that the Wise Traditions Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.